Hello you, welcome back to my channel, or if you are new here, allow me to introduce myself real quick. My name is Matthew Mitchell, and I'm also going to learn these sounds about time-lapse travel tutorials, and today I am talking about a new camera for me. And it is still a new camera. If you know me, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I've been shooting on Canon for pretty much my entire life, up until a few weeks ago when I got an email from Panasonic UK asking me if I wanted to get involved with a campaign for the new Panasonic Lumix S1 camera. Now, it's a new camera, it's a new camera for me, it's me in a new city. I thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity. Let's jump on board and get on that campaign. So I made my first video with them that you can watch here. It's a full time-lapse film about how I see London and what is special to me and how I use that camera. Besides the campaign, I also wanted to review this camera as a time-lapse photographer. So this is not part, this video that you're watching right now is not part of that paid campaign. I'm just saying this to give you context as to how biased I may or may not be. I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible, but of course when you're working with a big brand and you get gifted a camera, it's always a bit difficult. That being said, this is a really great time-lapse camera. Now, this review will only talk about this from the eyes of a time-lapse photographer, because otherwise it's going to be an hour-long video. I will link some other videos and reviews in my blog that you can find down below, where people review this camera from all other angles as landscape photographers, portrait photographers, or uh, videographers as well because it's an amazing video camera as well. But yeah, this one's going to focus just on time-lapse because that's what I know most about and that's what I've been doing for uh, my entire adult life. When I got the camera, I did a little unboxing, so let's cut to that for those that love unboxings like I do. First up, if you get this box, this box feels amazing. It's got a really nice, smooth, soft finish. Great for um, spitting on and ruining it straight away. <laughs> oh man. I didn't even shoot any product shots yet of it. Anyways, you open it and we see three cardboard thingies. This lifts out with the flaps, that feels so nice. These are manuals. Then, this box. Chargers, we got a battery, battery charger, power plug, power adapter, another power cable, USB-C to USB-C, USB to USB-C, Lumix S1 neck strap. And what is this? Oh, I know what that is. This is a, a mounty thing for cables on the side of the camera so that you can shoot tethered without it getting snagged out of your camera. So that's that. There's a third cardboard box in here. We got ourselves a little lens hood and a beefy, but not too heavy, 24 to 105 lens. So this is a great focal range, both wide angle and tele or zoom or whatever you want to call it. That feels nice and smooth. I'm immediately impressed and in love. It's got optical image stabilization, AF, and a lock, so you can't zoom in or out with that lock, so that's good. Now finally we have here the actual camera. Get ready for it. One, two. <laughs> Imagine if that camera flies away. That'd be so bad. Boom, here we have it. This is the Panasonic Lumix S1, and straight away, it feels quite chunky. Like, it's a chunky, this is definitely not a small camera, this is definitely not uh, the GH5, which which is all, you know, slightly smaller, also has a different sensor, of course, but yeah, this thing feels um, feels big and hefty and feels really nice in the hand. Love it. Start time image count. Ooh, it's got a dedicated time-lapse mode. What? Bang. We are back in the present and I've shot a bunch with it, made that little short film with it. I can tell you already, this is an amazing time-lapse device. Now, let's break down why that is. First up, the image quality. My daily drivers, my usual cameras that I shoot with are a Canon 1DX Mark II and two 60 Mark IIs. And just from a couple of RAW files that I looked at in Lightroom, I can already tell you that recovering highlights and shadows is so much better on this camera. There's so much less noise when pulling those sliders than on the Canon sensors that it tells me that this is simply a better sensor than the cameras. I'm not a completely technical reviewer, so I don't know all the details about the graphs and stuff, but I've looked online and it turns out that the performance of this camera, as far as the sensor goes, with noise and dynamic range is outclassing all other cameras in its category. Regarding ISO and noise, DP Review says, compared to the EOS R, the Z6, and the A7 III, across the board, the S1 is among the best performing low light cameras in its class. So that's a big deal. I've linked that in the blog as well. And then regarding dynamic range, Digital Camera World says, the Lumix S1 retains its lead over the competition when it comes to dynamic range. So that's very exciting. That means I can shoot with less filters, less graduated filters and stuff like that because it's easier to recover those 
highlights or shadows depending on the shot that I'm shooting with. Means less gear, lighter weight, faster setup, all that. So makes for a pretty efficient little kit. Next up is the build quality. Now I'm gonna be honest, when Panasonic reached out to me, I was excited to be shooting with a smaller camera. I've pulled my neck and my back a bunch of times over the last year because running around with a 6D2 and a 1DX and a bunch of lenses is just, it's, it's taxing on the body, it's not good. And I'm actually still sore from that Utah trip, which is just not fun. So I've been looking at a lighter camera setup. Uh, I've been obviously looking at mirrorless setups and all that. When the S1 arrived, I realized that this is not a small or a lightweight camera. It is, as you can see, quite big, bulky, and it's definitely quite heavy. Now, as far as comfort goes, that's not ideal, but as far as time-lapse goes, that's really quite good because the heavier the camera, the heavier the setup, the less shake you will have from vibrations or wind. Also, when you're shooting a hyperlapse, having that heavy camera with a bit of momentum because it's just a little bit heavier makes it easier to shoot really steady shots when you're on the move. I hope that makes sense. So, besides that, the ergonomics are great. It feels really well. It's, an, it's got a really good finish. All the buttons feel like they're gonna last forever. Um, apparently it's got really good weather sealing as well. I haven't been able to test that, but yeah, it's a solid, sturdy, chunky, clunky, slightly heavy device that I feel like can go through quite a bit before you would notice any um, deterioration in its performance. Does that even make sense? It's a solid device is what I'm trying to say. Up next, let's talk about usability. As I mentioned earlier, this camera's got a ton of shooting modes and is quite diverse when it comes to photography and videography as well. Not only that, but it has a dedicated time-lapse mode that you go through via the mode button right here, which puts it in time-lapse mode, obviously. Now there's two modes within time-lapse mode. One is time-lapse shooting and the other is stop motion. Let's talk about the options you get when shooting in time-lapse mode first. The first menu option that you get to adjust when going through the menu when setting up your shot is shooting interval on or off. Now, I didn't understand what this meant. I'm like, of course you wanna have an interval when you're shooting time-lapse, however, Interval on means that you will shoot according to the interval that you set in the menu at a later stage. Interval off means that the camera is just going to shoot as fast as it can, which is the equivalent, I think, of just holding down the shutter button. This might be useful, for example, when you want to shoot with an interval that is faster than one second, which is the limit, the lowest limit on the interval here or on a lot of remotes. And it could be useful in a couple other scenarios when you want to shoot like in a stop motion style setup where you need to shoot faster than a one second interval. I'm sure there's many other scenarios where you can use it. It's a bit niche, but it might be good to have there when you need it, I guess. The next thing you can select is start time, which is fun and is not built into many other cameras. So you can actually select the time. It's a 24 hour clock that you can choose when your shot will start, which is quite useful when you, for example, set it somewhere and then you want only to start shooting in an hour or whatever it is. This could be a multi-camera setup I remember uh, traveling, working for a tourism board where I had one camera in the room that started like two hours before sunset and I was just going through the card. But because I couldn't be there and at the beach at the same time, I had to let it run already. This would have saved that quite easily if I could just have a delay on that start of that time-lapse shot. So yeah, being able to set the start time is really quite useful. Up next is image count with four digits that gives you a maximum image count of 9,999 images. I usually overshoot or at least I set my shot count to more than I expect it to be because you never know what happens. You might want to keep shooting for a bit longer. It's easier to just stop a sequence before it finishes then restart a sequence when it's already finished. Then we have the shooting interval. The minimum interval is one second and the maximum interval is 99 minutes and 59 seconds. I can't think of many time-lapse shots where you need something like that where you would use a kit like this. But hey, I guess it's good to have. Again, you have that flexibility and it's up to you what you choose. Then we have, as always, the most exciting feature in any time-lapse camera software, exposure leveling. You could call this holy grail mode. If you turn exposure leveling off, it's just gonna shoot with the static manual exposure that you've chosen. You're gonna start your sequence with a certain setting and it's gonna end the sequence with that setting as well. With exposure leveling on, the camera will actually adjust the settings as long as the light is changing, it will adjust the settings accordingly. Now, a lot of cameras fail at this. A lot of cameras don't even have this option. This camera, I only was able to test it once. This camera did an absolutely flawless job. Here is a sequence that I shot on the uh, river bank, a sunset. Luckily, it was a beautiful sunset, which is quite rare here in London. 
I did not touch the camera. I might make a separate video about this. I'll actually, I'll, I'll write more about this on the blog with all the finer details about how I set it up. But to have a sequence like this, straight out of camera, untouched, did not put it through LR time lapse, did not adjust anything as far as exposure goes. I only added a little bit of saturation. This is straight out of camera. This is incredibly, incredibly impressive. And I'm super excited that this worked that well. So instead of adjusting the settings with one third of a stop, the camera actually did minute adjustments both in shutter speed and ISO and resulted in an absolutely flawless, flicker-free, holy grail, day to night sunset sequence. I then used that footage to make a time slice, which looks like this. If you would like to get a tutorial about that, you can click right here where I explain the process in how I do this. Uh, it's a very popular effect and you're seeing it more and more on social media these days. And yeah, if you want to do it as well, check out the tutorial. I think you'll like it. The second mode that you get in the dedicated time-lapse mode is stop motion animation. Now, I assume we all know what stop motion is. It's where you, the shooter, decide the interval, even though you can also set your interval from one to, let me just double check here, 60 seconds. A stop motion animation is where you animate a subject and then click and then animate again and then click as opposed to the interval decides for you. Now, the cool thing about this stop motion mode is that it shows you with a lower opacity overlay the two previous photos that you've taken so you have a reference point for what you're currently animating. That's great for stop motion, obviously. That's also really, really exciting for hyperlapse photography where the goal is to keep the image as close as the previous image as possible but you're stepping and shooting and stepping. If you want to know how I shoot hyperlapses, watch this video here. But pretty much this is going to help massively when you're framing up your subject on a hyperlapse track. Another thing you can do is shoot part of a sequence, then go outside, shoot a family event, shoot whatever, come back, then open up that folder and continue shooting in that folder. So you have the option to start shooting again within a certain sequence. Then once you are done shooting your time lapse or your stop motion, you can pause the sequence or you can end it. Then you get a little dialogue that asks if you want to render a video. So not only are you shooting a JPEG in a RAW or just a RAW or just a JPEG sequence, at the end of that, you get the option to render that video straight away in camera. Not just that, but also, again, it allows you to choose uh, from resolutions going from 4K all the way to HD, from 4K 30 to Full HD 60, down to 25 frames per second for the video file. It also lets you decide the playback frame rate, so you'll have the video file with a certain resolution and frames per second but the actual content within that will be played back at a uh, frame rate from 50 all the way down to one frames per second. Then lastly, with time-lapse and stop motion, it allows you to render it in the uh, normal chronological way that you shot it, or you can render the sequence in reverse playback. I'm not entirely sure when that's useful, possibly with stop motion where you're doing something backwards. It's good to get that little preview video uh, in reverse, but that's the only scenario that I can think of where that would be useful. But it's good to have if you ever need it. All these things just show you how much thought has gone into designing these modes, not only just the camera, but also the firmware behind it, the usability. I would love to know who they talk to, which stop motion animators, which time-lapse photographers to get feedback on how to develop these modes because it's really, as you can tell by my energy levels, probably really quite exciting to have all that really smart intelligence stuff built in to the standard camera. Like, I feel like this was actually designed for time-lapse photographers as opposed to being a camera. And then, oh yeah, let's put in time-lapse mode in there. No, there's been a lot of thought put into these modes and I'm really, really excited about that. Let's talk about some other features of this camera. Questions I've gotten through social media as soon as I announced that I'm shooting with this camera or questions that I had myself. I researched the battery life straight away because that's something important with time-lapse cameras. What's the battery life like? Can you charge it while you're shooting? Is it usable still? Blah, blah, blah. The battery life on paper is rated for about 400 photos per full charge. When I read that, I was like, no way. If that's true, that's really bad. Luckily, it's not true. My first shoot, I went out with 100% battery. I started shooting and then 1,821 photos later, I still had 33% of a charge, which is really quite good. Then the next day, I went out again, 100% battery, I shot 2,039 photos and I still had 42% remaining. So the first day I was going through all the menus, I was shooting a lot of video files as well, which uh, meant that I drained the battery more quickly. But yeah, so luckily you can shoot many, many sequences just on a single battery charge. And then of course, it is just so beautiful that so many things are USB-C these days. It's got a USB-C port on the side. You can just plug a battery bank in there as you're shooting, nothing will change. A little uh, power icon will appear on the display on the back or at the top indicating that it's charging 
and you can just keep shooting for as long as you want, which I love so much. Now, in between shoots, we were having a beer at a cafe when we were shooting for that first time-lapse film. The battery was at 42%. I decided to plug it in for 15 minutes, see how much it charged, and it only charged for 7%, I believe, after 15 minutes, which is not a lot. It's something, but it's not great. I definitely was expecting it to charge faster, but maybe that was because of the battery I was using was a bit older and it's just not as powerful anymore. I don't know. I don't know how batteries work, but I was expecting it to charge a little bit faster from a battery. That being said, it comes with a USB-C charger and that is supposed to be the optimal fastest charging mode uh, that you have with this camera. So obviously I suggest that you use the charger that comes with the camera, but it's good to have that option to use a power bank when you're out and about. I actually haven't used that charger since I've gotten this camera. I've just been using my phone charger to charge this thing, which is quite exciting. When you're shooting a time-lapse, it'll tell you the exact time when the shot will finish. This saves you a lot of calculating in your head or doing a little bit of math on your phone, figuring out the amount of photos that you're shooting at the interval, when you're starting and when it's gonna end. Every time I shoot with my other cameras, I set a timer. Now I can just look and see how much time I've got left. It also shows you the amount of photos that are left in the sequence on the back, but not at the top, just as a little FYI. Camera allows you to pause a time-lapse shot, which is good for when you wanna check settings or change something. You can activate a night mode, which I feel like is dedicated to astrophotographers. So the whole display turns red, which means that the red light of the screen won't reset your eyes sensitivity to light. That's why all astrophotographers have little red headlight torch, because when you're out and about in the middle of the night, You've let your eyes adjust to the darkness. You can see a lot of stars and you can see your surroundings. As soon as you flash a white screen, you reset that sensitivity. But if the screen is red or if the LED light is red, you actually don't reset that sensitivity. So again, I feel like this is a feature where they listen to people that have been out in the field and have been complaining about how the back screen of their camera resets their eye sensitivity. It's just really good to have that in there. Another super useful thing for time-lapse photographers is the sheer overlay mode. So you can load an old image, put that on the screen with a lower opacity, and then use the viewfinder or whatever it is when you're angling your shot to find the exact same spot that you're at. This is, for example, useful if you're shooting seasonal time-lapses. If you have a spot that you go to that you're shooting a sequence of in the summer, and then you want to revisit that in fall, spring, winter, whenever, you can load that photo on there and then find the exact same framing. So you don't have to like weld a tripod or a clamp to a railing somewhere. You can just try and get it as close as possible by having that sheer overlay. Another really good example of how much thought has gone into that. I know I've said that a lot, but that's because I'm actually really excited about how good this camera is for time-lapse photographers. Hardware, you can flick out of time-lapse mode into another shooting mode, then flick back to time-lapse mode, and it will have retained all your settings. A lot of other cameras don't have this. This just saves you a lot of time when setting up. So you can shoot a time-lapse, go shoot some video, shoot some stills of the spot that you're at, then go back to time-lapse and shoot more. It's a small thing, but it will save you a lot of time in the long run. The semi-flip screen, it's definitely more useful than not having a flip screen at all for setting up weird angles. Can tell you the amount of times that I've been setting up on a really low wide angle and I've had to lie down on the floor with my 1DX to have a look at my screen. I've uh, <laughs> Sometimes I've used my phone as a reflection or I've used my phone front facing camera to look at the screen and then look on my phone. Um, the flip screen as odd as it may be, is really still quite useful. This camera is very famous for its built-in stabilization, not just the lens, but the in-body image stabilization. Paired with the lens, I believe they call it IBIS-2 or dual IBIS, whatever. It's amazing for when you're shooting hyperlapses handheld. Cannot tell you how steady this thing is when you're shooting, when you're walking forward or sideways or whatever. It keeps it so nice and steady. Not only that, but the digital level, both in the viewfinder and on the screen, really accurate so you keep your camera as level as possible and those things just make hyperlapse photography so much easier again check out this video here or the one that was on the screen earlier where i explain how i shoot hyperlapses handheld then you'll see how useful this dual image stabilization is for when you're shooting hyperlapses regarding that stabilization it's actually so good that in theory you could shoot a long exposure hyperlapse handheld here's a photo i took at 42 millimeters so that's like semi semi zoomed in with one sixth of an exposure. As you can see, the car is entirely blurry, but the buildings behind it are tack sharp. So that's an experiment I might do very soon where I try and shoot a long exposure hyperlapse completely handheld without using a gimbal or a monopod or a tripod. Again, this might speed things up quite a lot because of the 
amazing capabilities that this camera system has. The camera's dual storage gives you lots of storage options. One port is XQD, which I don't own. It's incredibly fast, but it's also still really expensive. The other one is an SDXC UHS-2 port. I've got a bunch of these cards. They're much cheaper and you can pop old SD cards in there as well. So quite a lot of options. There's also a bunch of options on how you write stuff to the cards that is entirely adjustable depending on how you shoot. You can write to both cards, write to one, have one as a backup, just switch between whatever. It's good to have those options. There's cameras out there that only have one storage port and that's just quite very limiting. This camera has a dedicated 2.5 millimeter TRS jack input for the remotes. Now, I haven't used the remote on this camera because the built-in time-lapse mode, as you would have noticed by now, are just so good. But this opens up, um, you know, a bunch of possibilities with, for example, the LR Timelapse Pro Timer, which you can check out over here, or the Timelapse View Plus, or any other remote that has one of those uh, simple jack connection jacks. <laughs> the electronic viewfinder is adjustable in display frame rate all the way up to 120 hertz, and you can change the size of it as well, so you don't have to smush your whole eyeball into this little porthole here. Uh, you can zoom out a little bit or zoom in depending on how you look at it so you can see more of the image with that again yeah smacking your whole eyeball in there and then smudging up the screen with your nose besides that as i've read on the reviews and from my personal experience as well this evf is world class it is the current leader according to the others as far as quality and uh, performance goes so Again, quite an exciting little feature in this camera. The back buttons are illuminated, or at least you can set them up to be illuminated, which is great for when you're setting up your shot in the dark, obviously. The shutter can be set to automatic, mechanical, electronic first curtain, electronic, electronic, and noise reduction. I think I've got them all right. Yeah, nailed it. I had to Google what they all meant. I've linked that post in the blog where you can read up about it. I just think it's good that you have a bunch of options. You have, for example, the completely silent mode, so you don't hear a thing, you don't hear a peep when you're shooting, which is great for when you're, for example, shooting a wedding time-lapse inside a small church. Yes, I've done that, and yes, I was incredibly embarrassed to have my DSLR clicking away at one frame per second, distracting everyone from a beautiful ceremony. There are many more things that I love about this camera that are not related to time-lapse photography. Here are a few. The video resolutions, frame rates, and codecs are incredible. Like, this is an incredibly powerful video camera if you look at the price point and what you get for it. The high-resolution photo mode, which shifts the sensor eight times when you're shooting from a tripod and gives you a 96-megapixel photo. I've tested this. It's incredible. I should try and shoot a time-lapse with that, but it'll take forever. But yeah, the resolution that you get with that technology is really, really cool. So this is a 24.2 megapixel camera. You can get 96 megapixel photos out of that, which is really good for example, landscape photographers. I'm also really excited about the L-Mount Alliance. So Panasonic, Sigma, and Leica have teamed up for the L-Mount system, I guess. So they're all gonna be bringing out lenses with this specific mount. I think by the end of uh, 2020, there's gonna be who knows how many lenses a bunch available currently. I'm not sure how many lenses there are for this system. Not a ton, but that's going to change really soon. And it's, again, really great to have, uh, you know, a world-leading lens maker like Leica and Sigma working together on a specific lens mount. So lots of lenses to come very soon. I really like the price point of this camera. People have been saying it's expensive, but compare it to the rest and compare it to, for example, a 1DX Mark II, which has very similar performance in a lot of ways. This is quite cheap. Depends on your angle though. But yeah, I personally like the price point of this camera. Another cool thing is the 6K photo burst mode with pre-recording. So if you're waiting, for example, for something to happen and you click, it bursts a bunch of 6K, so 6,000 pixels, um, photos before you shot it. So for example, my friend Romanelli, years ago in Vanuatu, shot a butterfly leaving a little branch or a leaf or something like that and he managed to get a beautiful shot using that pre-recording 6k burst mode just really cool technology that's built in i love the 180 frames per second full hd video mode yes it is limited to auto exposure i don't know if that's going to change in the future with the firmware upgrade but 180 frames per second at full hd is really quite cool i used that in the opening sequence for my previous time lapse video the one that I shot all over London. There's a bunch more things that I love about this camera, but let's wrap it up here. Now let's briefly talk about the things that I don't like as much about this camera. Otherwise it wouldn't really be a balanced review, would it? As I mentioned at the start, it is bigger and it is heavier than I expected. I was hoping for a smaller and a lighter weight system to heal my neck and just have a lighter camera bag. Sadly, it's not that. You still get a bunch of performance out of it though. So 
you know, you win some, you lose some. Something really great about Canon cameras and lenses is the aperture lock, the lens twist method for time lapse. When you're shooting at an aperture of say f11, you can actually lock that aperture inside your lens so you don't get any aperture flickering. I haven't figured out how to do that on the system. I'm not sure if it's possible. I hope there's gonna be a workaround for that. But for now, I'll be shooting wide open with filters in the front if I have to, to prevent aperture flickering, or I will be using LR time lapse or another deflickering plugin in After Effects to deflicker my footage from the aperture flickering. If you don't know what aperture flickering is, I of course have a video about that and a blog post that you can check out in the description down below. Because it is a mirrorless camera, dust will get to the sensor more easily. I do not like dust on my sensor. It's one of the reasons I have stuck with DSLRs for so long. If you're on the field, you're traveling, you're in the desert, the rain, forest, the jungle, whatever, wherever you are, dust will hit your sensor more easily on a mirrorless camera than on a reflex camera and I'm not excited about that. So I might have to buy one of those sensor cleaning kits and learn how to do it myself. Ergonomics wise, as much as I love the layout of the camera, there's one thing I would change. I would put the play button on the right side so you can shoot one hand and then quickly play. I never have image review on, so whenever I shoot a photo, it never shows the photo because it just saves battery. It slows down your camera when you're shooting time lapses. So I always have to click and then hit play to review my image. I wish the play button was on the right because it would just make life a little bit easier. The flip screen, it's good to have it. It's not amazing. I wish I could flip it around completely like on the 6D where you take it out and protect that because I feel like from all the travel and banging around in my bag and on a sling, I will be scratching the screen. So I should be looking at getting a protector for it. And it's, yeah, I just don't know. I don't know about this whole thing. It might be a little bit fragile. Time will tell. That's it for the negatives list. Not long as per usual. I pretty much only ever talk about gear that I l use. And when I use it, that means that I like it. So there's not a bunch of negatives here. Now to wrap up this review, the Panasonic Lumix S1 is an amazing camera and it is an even better time-lapse camera. I highly recommend this for anyone that's looking for a serious time-lapse system. I will be using this personally on all of my time-lapse shoots from here on out because it feels like it's almost built for time-lapse and hyperlapse photographers. I'm really excited about it. I'm really grateful for Panasonic to get me on that campaign and to send me this thing so I can review it and shoot with it. I'm really grateful to you personally for being here and watching this thing all the way to the end. Check out the blog where I have more information about the camera. I've got a little bit more information about how I shot that holy grail. I've got some links there. Yeah, if you have any questions about it, drop it in the comments down below. I'll try and get back to you or use it for a future video. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you on the next video. And here we are again at that end screen. Buy my eBooks, support a independent freelance creator like myself by checking out my sales page about my eBooks. One's about time-lapse, one's about astro time-lapse. Buy them in a bundle and save a bit of money. How bloody good. Also check out the other videos listed down here and subscribe there if you haven't already.